Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved fantasy lore, characters, themes, theories, and more. I'm Lexi. And I'm Nicole. And today we have a special Empyrean bonus episode. Ah, I'm so excited. Covering the newly released Zayden POV Chapter 27 from Fourth Wing. As always, let's start with our content warnings. While this episode focuses on Fourth Wing's new Zayden POV Chapter 27, this discussion also includes anything from Iron Flame, Zayden's other Fourth Wing POV chapters, interviews with Rebecca Yaros. Basically, bottom line, if it's Empyrean related, we very well might bring it up. So with all of that said, if you don't know why GFDD is dancing on Zayden's last nerve, then please go finish that bonus chapter. Or if you don't have access to it and you don't want to wait, just know what you're getting yourself into here. Next, we of Fantasy Fangirls are adults who say adult things about adult books. In other words, friends, this podcast is rated R. You might not think it, but I've got a sex theory for this episode, (laughs) and yes, it will be rated R. So do be mindful of those little listening ears. We'll also be quoting Zayden quite a bit, and... (laughs) He does not have a clean mouth. No, he does not. (laughs) We also want to remind you of our upcoming live show at Comedy Works South in Denver, Colorado on October 20th. Our topic is the biggest questions and predictions in the lead up to Onyx Storm. VIP tickets are sold out. They sold out like within 48 hours. It was crazy. But we do have a small amount of general admission tickets still available. So go, go, go. Get your tickets, tickets, tickets. And the link is in the show notes. And lastly, if you love fantasy fangirls and can't get enough of Empyrean or Akatar content. If you want more community, more events, and just more all around, please check out our Patreon. We have three membership tiers that you can join. Right now, their names are very Akatar themed, but we will switch them back to that Empyrean theme in January when we cover Onyx Storm. We first up have the Valkyries, which includes access to our Bop and Discord, live Q&As from Lexi and I, community events, a book club, promo codes for live events, plus a 20% off discount for the merch store. That is $5 a month, or you can join the High Fae, which includes everything from the Valkyrie level, plus early access to ad free episodes, special voting privileges, and that is for $10 a month. Then, of course, we have our newest and highly requested tier, the Inner Circle, which includes everything from the first two tiers, plus way more behind the scenes content, a welcome gift from Lexi and I, giveaways, a private Discord channel called In the Dining Room, and your name is shouted out on the podcast. That is for $25 a month. Join the party at Patreon dot com slash fantasy fangirls. The link is, of course, also in the show notes. And really and truly, thank you so much for supporting us as we've turned this podcast into our livelihood. It all started with Fourth Wing, and we're just so excited for Onyx Storm coming up here soon. It's just everything here is because of you and your support. And thank you so much. And now it is time to shit on Dane Atos. God fucking damn it, Dane! (laughs) In this Fourth Wing Zayden POV Chapter 27, we get some new information, though I'll be honest, nothing groundbreaking for the overall story, at least as far as we can tell. We do get a few theory confirmations, which is amazing because, yes, I was right. And this bonus chapter has us thinking about one or two new-ish theories, too. I actually have three. Three (laughs) new theories. All right. I I love it. So first up, let's all attend Battle Brief with Nicole, where she summarizes what happened in this bonus chapter. And friends, she is going to go into a little bit more detail than usual for any listeners who don't have access to the Zayden POV chapter yet and don't mind spoilers. Chapter 27, Zayden's POV. On a field trip to Montserrat, half of Second Squad plus wing leader Zayden Ryerson are sitting around the briefing table and GFDD is living up to his name, glaring across the room at Zayden. Nice try, my guy, but it's not as menacing as he thinks. Time to play fake battle scenarios led by the middle Soringale child, Mira. Pretend that overnight they found a newly fortified enemy outpost crossing into the Navarre border. In Zayden's mind, we get a sneak peek as to how he earned the title of wing leader. He creates not one, not two, but four different battle scenarios, all the while trying to not think about kissing Violet. Way to multitask, my guy. But sadly, it's not all about thinking about Violet's perfect lips. It is clear that there is a lot of prejudice in the room towards these marked ones, which, of course, Violet clears her throat to non-verbally tell her sister to back the fuck off, making Zayden's cock hard. I mean, (laughs) making his chest tighten with love. (laughs) First things first, who is in command of this fake mission? GFDD, god fucking damn it, Dane, immediately puts 
puts his hand up, to which Liam is like, uh, bro, our wing leader's here. But Zayden's not in the mood to win that battle. Instead, that wispy silver pocket in his mind is too tantalizing to ignore. This could be fun. Zayden takes the opportunity to talk into Violet's mind for the first time, startling the shit out of her. But GFDD asks the question that we are all thinking. Why are you here, wing leader? <laughs> to which Sigale wastes no time to start mocking Zayden for dragging her out here. Yes, it was indeed Zayden's idea, but that's not the only theory we get confirmed. Where's our pink haired friend? She is off on a drop off mission an hour south with the flyers, having wiped the memory of the infirmary healer that she is supposed to be in the care of. But oh, that's right. We have a fake mission to plan for. Brilliant fucking woman over everyone's shit steps up to the plate, including not so subtly reminding everyone that there is a very powerful shadow wielder who can just black out the entire outpost. Not passing up the opportunity to show off a little, Zayden gives a demonstration, including a little caress of Violet's cheek with shadowy magic. The fake mission is complete. Good job, guys. But Mira is nowhere near done. She orders Dane, Violet, and Zayden to the hallway. And after putting up a sound shield, of course, which Zayden notes his could have been better, she lays into Dane. Only after telling him that he's blowing his chances of becoming wing leader. Gods help us if that ever happens. Dane leaves and Mira turns to Violet and Zayden, accusing her of not really knowing Zayden and his motives could very well be to make sure she never reaches her full potential. Totally ignoring the fact that he's the only one not coddling her, but oh well. Just as Mira is about to spill some Lilith and Zayden past beans, Zayden interrupts, mentioning how he's here and she's not missing out on shit, but skirt! What's that? There's a lack of humming in the air. The wards are down. This isn't the marked ones doing. There's an enemy in the keep. Of course, I'm going to lose my mind over this shit later. Mira forces Zayden, Violet, and the rest of Second Squad to leave, and Zayden takes Violet to go get her pack, while he steps into his room to get his considerably lighter one. But there's a blonde goodest boy, Liam, looking at him with accusation, needing to ensure that the wards falling is not the marked ones doing. Up on the roof, Liam and Dane both mount their dragons one better than the other which of course Satan points out while they're under attack but Taryn is a little delayed so knowing he needs to stall Violet Satan reaches for her and passionately kisses her Brrr. only after they pull away does Violet realize the motivation behind this distraction and she is livid with her shadow daddy she's scooped up by Taryn and Satan guiltily mounts the gale field trip over I'm so excited to be back in this world. Oh my goodness. All right, friends, it is time to tap into our signet powers and discuss key insights, reflections, foreshadowing, and theories from this fourth wing Zayden POV chapter 27. So real quickly, talking about this overall, I think that this bonus chapter is on par with the other Zayden POV chapters we've received, which by the way, we include the link to the other two bonus chapters in the show notes. I loved getting his perspective on this Montserrat visit where he speaks into Violet's head for the first time and the outpost comes under Griffin Flyer attack. We had quite a few theories surrounding this Montserrat visit with Emogen's absence and the Griffin attack. So it was fantastic to get this confirmation on our original speculation. Did it provide super exciting new information? Not really, which I do believe is strategic. Since these bonus chapters aren't necessary for the advancement of the story, they're great, don't get me wrong, I love them, but they're also only there for a little extra context and of course more Zayden, which in my opinion is how bonus chapters should be. Readers shouldn't have to buy a certain edition of the book or wait for the author to post them on their website, which thank you very much for doing that, Rebecca, to get crucial information about the plot or characters. I'm looking at you as real POV bonus chapter for Silver Flames. I, I agree with you entirely and I'm going to even expand a few little things like personally I don't think I had the Montserrat scene very high on my oh this is definitely going to be the Bones chapter list but am I mad that we got it absolutely not it makes sense that we got this scene especially given how important it is with him flirt this is like really the first time we see him flirting with Violet it's also the first time he talks into her mind it's also the second kiss that we get like there's just so many nuances that we get here like you said did we get any new groundbreaking information not really. I might go off on that a little bit later with a theory. <laughs> so maybe possibly, but it would be in a very Rebecca Yaros way. It's not on the page where we get the like groundbreaking information. But if you look a few levels deeper, there might be something in between the lines. But I am almost glad for the fact that we didn't get any new groundbreaking info like right there on the page. Because like you said, like if it's a bonus chapter, not everyone's going to read it or even know to read it. Like there are still people who are like, I had no idea there were bonus chapters for Silver Flames or like you and I who when we were covering this 
Mist and Fury, we learned about a bonus chapter for Mist and Fury and we had no idea. So it's like, I, I love that these, these aren't here to provide story altering information. For example, it makes sense that we get a scene where Zayden's shields, again, are naturally up. Meaning, if you have not read Iron Flame, you wouldn't get like Zayden's second signet spoiled for you. It makes a lot of sense that we're getting a lot of information that is within the context of Fourth Wing, not with Iron Flame. Especially since the previous two bonus chapters also didn't have any of that info included. The Lilith deal was not on the page. The second signet wasn't on the page. Although I do love that this one highly alludes to the Lilith deal. So like if you have read Iron Flame, you do kind of have that little extra bit of context and you're like, ooh. Anyway, I loved getting this particular scene because it is so fun to be in Zayden's mind from flirting with Violet, knowing that he's in love with her. And of course, more Dane dunking, which is delicious. Any Seagal banter, it's one of my favorite parts, but my favorite, favorite part of this entire bonus chapter was seeing a Zayden and Liam scene and their brotherhood much more on the page. Like I, I'm overjoyed that we got this. It was wonderful. I enjoyed reading it over and over and over again. All right. So let's dive into this bonus chapter. I love going back to the God fucking damn it, Dane fourth wing days where we genuinely didn't know what Dane's motives were. And we wondered if he was, you know, for instance, purposely stealing Violet's memories all along. Our opinions certainly have shifted after Iron Flame and Dane has like 99% convinced us that he isn't guilty. But I gotta love Zayden immediately transporting us back to the good old days with this opening line, quote, Dane Atos is dancing on my last fucking nerve. It immediately sets the tone for the Dane dunk sesh that we're about to have. And it's just, it, oh God, it's delicious. I love that that was the opening line. <laughs> One of my favorite things about any Zayden POV is how he talks about Dane. It is so on point. It's so in character for him. And it makes me laugh every time. Like, no matter how we feel about Dane now after Iron Flame, it's just so much fun to see him from a different character's POV. These two guys are having their staring contest and Zayden's all smug about winning. And then, of course, the way he narrates hating everything about Dane. Quote, what a suck up. Gods help every cadet if that happens about Dane becoming wing leader, which, yes, that does happen. Or when he's narrating about Dane glaring and he's like, oh, his glares he thinks are menacing. <laughs> or I, this, I loved this part, when they're climbing up onto the roof at the very end and he's like, is Dane out of breath? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> but I got to say, my personal favorite was when Dane runs to Kath and they're literally under attack and Zayden's like, he's nowhere near as fast as Liam. Like they're under attack and he still has time to diss Dane. I love it. This dunking on Dane is at another level from what we've seen in chapters 9 and 16. And I really do think that a major part of that is while he's not entirely jealous of Dane. He knows that Dane has a thing for Violet and he knows that they have a long history. So his, now that he's in love with Violet, his hatred of Dane has absolutely gone up compared to especially chapter nine. I mean, it's just, it's perfect. So yes, I absolutely agree with you on, with chapter nine. With chapter 16, that might have been my favorite only because Zayden's POV chapter 16 reaction to Dane and Violet kissing, that will live rent free in my head forever. It was like when he realized why he hated Dane in relation with Violet, you know, in that way. And for anyone who does not remember what that exact line was, don't worry, I pulled it. It says, quote, Soren Gale looks like she just kissed her cousin and can't retreat fast enough. Classic. I love it. Like, again, I love the Dane dunking in this chapter, too. But nothing beats that. I'm I sorry. Say, I'm I, sorry. <laughs> I, think, I think the amount of Dane dunks have gone up. Yes. But the quality will never top. <laughs> Soren Gale looks like she just kissed her cousin. Like that was so, I will say, I don't know. I think that Dane not able to run as fast as Liam. Like, it's pretty neck and neck for me on that one. And then another thing that I love is the fact that Zayden refers to Dane's dad as his daddy, just like we call him on Fantasy Fangirls, Daddy Atos. Like just thank you, Rebecca. That made my day seeing that we're all on the same page with Daddy Atos. Speaking of Daddy Atos, when asked what Dane's signet is and he replies above your pay grade, Zayden thinks, quote, does he actually think think that? Or is he so brainwashed by daddy that he doesn't see they're going to use him as a weapon against other writers? Yes, this is exactly what Varish has Dane do against Violet in Iron Flame. And we know Varish and Daddy Atos are, or were, 
buddy, buddy. Dane did not realize he was being brainwashed into a weapon until that epic ending of part one in Iron Flame. Let's move our conversation into more general feelings towards Violet. So like I mentioned earlier, this is our first bonus chapter that we get with Zayden where his full feelings of I love Violet are on the page, which we know he fell in love with Violet during their first kiss back earlier in Fourth Wing. In chapter nine from Zayden's POV, there was definitely lust, but I'd say it was more of an inconvenience than anything. (laughs) Well, and then in his chapter 16, when he sees her kissing Dane, yep, I'm bringing it up again. He starts to get jealous and Sigal mocks him because she knows that he really does care. And then Garrick also makes fun of him for being jealous in that chapter too. But now he fully admits only to himself how in love he is with Violet and that he really is jealous of her longstanding relationship, even if it is platonic with Dane. And then we also see just how much this is fucking with him and creating an internal war. He says that he's fallen in love with the one woman on the continent that he cannot have. Now, while there are multiple reasons for this, the one that he highlights the most in this scene is just how much it would ruin her, how she looks with others if she were in a relationship with a marked one. Graduated writers are outright glaring at Zayden and Liam because of their parents' roles in the rebellion. And I should say they're actually glaring at the mark on their arms. Because remember, Zayden is the oldest marked one. So the graduated writers are just not used to being around marked ones at this time. Zayden and Garrick's class will be the first to graduate the quadrant and thus intermingle with the older writers. Because of that, there's so much prejudice. And honestly, Zayden wants Violet nowhere near that. Exactly. And then I'll even expand on that. You mentioned how he's the older marked one. Just being an older student in general, everyone knows that you don't sleep with anyone outside of your year. We learned that at the beginning of Fourth Wing with Mira. Violet will even get teased for her closeness to Dane, who's a second year, with people thinking that they're sleeping together. Like Zayden doesn't want to put her at risk for her reputation for sleeping with an older student. But does all of this, oh, I can't have Violet. She's the only girl on the continent I can't have. Does that stop him from flirting? No. <laughs> This is the first time, like you were saying, that Zayden really starts flirting with Violet. In fact, Nicole, you noted it during our deep dive coverage of this section, and I can see why. Zayden is able to admit to himself that he loves her. Remember that he did fall in love with her when they first kissed, and that was weeks ago. He came here because he missed her, and he couldn't, quote, concentrate for shit knowing that Violet was this close to the border. And now he has figured out that they can speak mind to mind. I love how he's like he thinks in his head, this could be... And then, of course, the Gale cuts in with dangerous, <laughs> reckless, an unaffordable distraction. And he's like, this could be fun. I don't think we've ever heard that word come from Zayden. And this is one of the reasons I love their relationship so much. So much of romanticy can be like intensity, nonstop passion, and just heightened emotion. And while I'm, there's definitely a lot of that with Zayden and Violet too, but here is Zayden saying, nah, I can at least have some fun with this. And that's one of the reasons I love their relationship so much. There is that, there is a very wide range of emotions with them. And as he's doing this, you know, speaking into her mind and like, oh, you can't help but be so violent. He's like on the brink of laughter. I love it. It's so much fun to see this lighthearted side of Zayden, especially while being in his mind. Now, while we're on the topic of flirting, I love the moment where Dane mentions how he's the wing leader and Zane thinks, quote, I can't help but wonder if he's submitting to my rank or accusing me of inappropriate behavior with a subordinate. <laughs> quote, if it were safe for Violet, I'd be ecstatically guilty of inappropriate behavior wickedly inappropriate. And this is the shit that just makes me like kick my legs up in the air and squeal. I love it. But then he goes on to mention how that wickedly inappropriate with her would be, quote, in my bed, in hers, on a table, in the archives, in the bathing chamber. Ahem! We have seen all of those except one. For now, at the end of Iron Flame, they're still up as Gaius. Well, that's what I'm saying. This is my sex theory. Do you <laughs> think that we're going to get a sex scene in the archives on a table in a future book? Yes, it's happening. I'm convinced now. It'd be too deliciously symbolic for Violet, too. <laughs> well, especially since Rebecca just finished writing Onyx Storm, I think that while she was writing this bonus chapter, she would have been in the plotting stages of Onyx Storm, or at least in like the first draft stage. So I am convinced this sex scene is in Onyx Storm. Convinced, especially like like you mentioned, they are at Vesgaia at the end of Iron Flame. 
Oh God, I'm so excited. Now I will say reading this for the first time, there's the Zayden's thinking quote, holy shit, we really are connected. This could be, and I thought the end of the sentence was going to be something like, this could be both of us being intrinsic or something along that line. Well, he does end up saying something about how vital this will be. He's like, oh my gosh, like this is a great tool for us to have in our arsenal. So oh, yeah. no, he says this is vital to my existence. Don't yes, worry. Exactly, I, have that, exactly. I have that memorized. <laughs> so in our fourth wing episode six deep dive of this chapter, we also speculated if it was Zayden or Sagal who couldn't stay away. And yep, it was Zayden who couldn't stay away from Violet. While Zayden points out to Sagal that it was her idea to bring the daggers for a griffin flyer drop, quote, it seemed a prudent course of action considering your insufferable intolerance to being separated from the general's daughter. We learned that it was not Sigail and Taryn who couldn't stay away from each other. Zayden just missed Violet so much and he was very worried about her being this close to the border. And boy, oh boy, Sigail doesn't miss out on a moment of mocking Zayden for it. After telling her that his behavior for being unsufferable is going a little far, she says, quote, where's Violet now? What is she doing? Is she thinking of me? Is she missing me? Is she getting closer to Atos? Does she dream about that kiss? How many days until Violet's? And he interrupts with point fucking taken and thinking how Sigail's going to be absolutely insufferable on the way home. I will take any morsel of Zayden and Sigail moments because, oh my God, it's just so glorious. But also I do want to point out that he was worried about her getting closer to Atos. Again, it's just showing that jealousy that he hates. He hates that he feels this way and I love it. <laughs> oh man, yep. Just like his other POVs, Sigail steals the show. Just, you know, she's always making fun of him at every chance for being a young 20-something year old guy who is horny and hopelessly in love. And the way she's like, yes, well, flying here was not without its perks of, you know, mocking you and bang, bang, bangity, bang with my mate. Honestly, we could just quote Sigail's lines here all day long. I love her sass. Yes. She's amazing. I should say that was not a direct quote from her, but you know what I mean. Paraphrasing here. Can you here. imagine if she was like, I'm just bang, bang, banging, any banging tear? And like, I would be like, Rebecca does listen to fantasy <laughs> bang girls. <laughs> During this first time speaking through their bond, Zane identifies Violet's, quote, wispy silver bond that's been steadily growing between the two of them. Very interesting that it's been steadily growing. I assume that their bond strengthens as Violet and Taryn's bond gets more powerful too. Remember that the first few months are when a bond is weakest between a dragon and its rider. Hence why it's the prime opportunity for an unbonded cadet to try and still get a dragon. It's so cool to realize how shocked Zayden is that speaking to her down the bond worked. It's got to be so surreal for Zayden, who is an intrinsic and can hear others' thoughts or, you know, sense their intentions. You get the idea. But now he is able to communicate his thoughts mind to mind to someone else. And he is having just so much fun with this, like Nicole was saying. Though being the strategic player he is, he also recognizes is how vital this communication method is for them and him. <laughs> That's so funny because I took the, like, this is vital to my existence as like being able to speak to her in this intimate way is now vital to his existence. That I took it in the very like romantic way rather than like the strategic Oh, yeah, I definitely took it as a strategic I think way, it's but. meant to be romantic, but that's okay. <laughs> now, let's move our conversation into the hallway. While they are getting their verbal takedown from Mira Sorengale, we get more I don't have any siblings mentions from Zayden. As we pointed out at nauseum during our Iron Flame coverage, there are so many instances where Zayden mentions not having siblings. I don't understand the sibling dynamic to the point where if the series ends and Zayden does not have a sibling of some sort, I will be shocked. Now, whether that's having a half sibling through his mom that he doesn't know anything about because she left when he was 10, yada, 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 or at least what I highly assume that Bodhi is actually his sibling. Now, whether that is a full brother or a half brother, I honestly could really see us uncovering this in Onyx Storm. I don't think that's going to be a later on in the series. I could really see that being in the next installment. As Zayden will later say, quote, Liam and Bodhi are the closest things I have to siblings. Yet another Bodhi parallel. I was initially surprised Garrick wasn't included in that. Same. I, and then I realized, well, maybe it's actually because they're in the same year. So it's more like, you know, best friends versus a big brother looking out for a little brother. But yes, we get so many mentions about Zayden not having a sibling that it feels like foreshadowing. Could it just be character descriptions? 
Absolutely. Like we, we understand that. But there's so much mystery around Zayden's family for us to not look at this with a magnifying glass, especially knowing how Rebecca Yaros, you know, drops these little Easter eggs everywhere. I, I do think that it has to be foreshadowing because there, it's just so consistent with how many mentions there are. Now, it is really sweet to see how Zayden sees, you know, Violet and Mira starting to get a little hyphy, like that sister fight with each other. And he's like, what the fuck do I do? <laughs> we get a call back to how he and Liam were raised. Quote, Llewellyn let Liam and me beat the shit out of each other when we fought. No wonder Liam is such a good fighter if he grew up fighting Zayden. Second, also, I love the little insight that we get into the upbringing at Llewellyn's. In Iron Flame, and now in this chapter two, it is confirmed that the Navarian family who fostered Zayden and Liam are actually on the rebellion side. House of Llewellyn in Tirvain pretends to be loyal to Navarre. Even King Tyree calls him a, quote, good man, loyal man. In fact, the power to represent the province of Tirandor was transferred from House Ryerson to House Llewellyn after the rebellion six years ago. But we know that Llewellyn was secretly on Zayden's side, which is why he and Liam were so well-trained both in fighting and in battle strategy, as noted in this chapter. And I'm guessing that this is also why Zayden was able to go to poor meal as often as he did, like to Corden when he was betrothed to Kat. His foster family didn't think of him or treat him like a traitor as they were expected to do. Okay, so question for you. When do you think we're going to meet Llewellyn? Because I, I have a <gasps> feeling we're absolutely going to meet this this dude at some point in the series. I, I mean, would like you, to think on Storm, but I, that's I kind of so a catch-all at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, if we learned anything from our predictions for I Iron Flame, we were like, oh, that's going to be a book four thing. Yes. Or, and it happened in Iron <laughs> Flame. Things are moving fast point. here, people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I can't help but think that as if I was Rebecca Yaros, if I'm writing this chapter and I also have Onyx Storm in my head, there are going to be certain things that are on a you know higher mental priority list. Llewellyn might be one of those things. Now, would it also make sense in the story as like how she's telling this with like Liam and Zayden and all this kind of stuff for it to just be brought up and it have nothing to do with Onyx Storm? Of course. But of course, my mind is like, but what if we get him? Because we do know that we're going to more places in Onyx Storm. So why would that not include the House of Llewellyn? Yep. Yep. All right. Now we get to talk about this. I'm so excited. One of the big pieces of information we get in this bonus chapter is confirmation that Emogen was indeed on a mission. In our episode six deep dive, I pointed out that Emogen wasn't mentioned after the first day in Montserrat until they were back at Vizcayeth. I shared how I was convinced Emogen used her memory wiping signet on the squad and outpost writers because she was part of this secret mission. From Violet's POV of this part, we were led to believe Zayden came here because Sagale couldn't be away from Taryn for more than three days. But when they hurriedly left the outpost, Violet noticed that Zayden's pack was considerably smaller than the one he arrived with. She figured he just left some stuff at the outpost to help get her out. But after the ending's reveal, we could safely assume Zayden was delivering weapons to Griffin Flyers. And ding, 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 we were right. Hold on. No, 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 no. I am not letting you say we. You were right, Leslie. <laughs> you absolutely were dying on this hill back in episode That was three. one of my very few hills that I was willing to die on yes well, I want you and for how much else credit. I got wrong in episode <laughs> six because that was when Jack fucking Barlow died <laughs> I'm taking my wins here okay please take this win I need you to take this win for yourself Zayden brought weapons for the flyers with him and handed them off to Emogen who then went off on the mission to drop them off to Griffin flyers an hour south now we learn in Zayden's POV here that she pretended she was vomiting and in the infirmary and she used her signet so the healer wouldn't remember her ever being there so yes there is a little bit of a difference there. But the bottom line is she did indeed use her signet. She was missing for a reason and she was on a secret mission. And Zayden did indeed bring her the weapons for the drop off. We also learn that she is an hour south towards the Bravik border and how rendezvousing there is a better option than getting caught by the Signes flyers where they are right on the border with Signeson. From my searches in the books, because yes, I immediately went and searched Bravik and Signeson. These are the two most active battle zones. However, Signeson is known to be a lot more deadly for a lot of reasons that I will get into in a moment. So a quick geographical reminder for you all, because it's not a fantasy fangirls and Pyrian episode without me talking about the maps. <laughs> Pormil is divided into three provinces. Krovla, which is the southern province. Stonewater River divides Krovla and its northern province neighbor, Breivik. We'll learn in Iron Flame that the Venon attacks and takeovers are most concentrated in Breivik, quote, even infecting dots in Signeson. 
Breivik also borders the Barons. Coincidence? I think not. It makes absolute sense that the Venon are first invading Breivik, and then they're starting to spread out to the other areas there. Speaking of, north of Breivik is Signeson. And Montserrat is near the border of the Signeson province and Navarre. The only thing separating them are the Espen Mountains. More on those in a moment. Plus, we do get a little info in this bonus chapter about the Signes Flyers. They're assholes. And they do not have the same working relationship, we'll call it, that Serena and Zayden have. Now, in my search for Signes in both the books, we learned that Rhee's village is on the border of Signes and, and Navarre, which we obviously get here in Navarre because she's right near it with Montserrat. And she mentions that she had to learn to defend herself very young because of their position on the map. In the squad battle, it is noted that the Signes and border has a lot of skirmishes near it, and that's where the fighting is most intense. And of course, this is the best place to send students. But as Quaid, who is the lead commander of Montserrat, says in Fourth Wing, it is the safest because where they are in the Espen Mountains. Exactly, because griffins aren't supposed to be able to fly at this altitude. But we learn in Iron Flame that the summit wing drifts are made up of griffins who can handle altitude at least better than the other griffins. So this attack is probably from a summit wing drift of Signes and Flyers. More on this in a moment, because I actually have a theory around this, but we'll come back to that in a minute. Because of having this information at the top of his mind, information around, you know, the the drop off, Imogen not being in the infirmary, so on and so forth. This is yet another bonus scene where Zayden has his shields firmly in place, which when Iron Flame came out and Rebecca Yaros was asked why in the previous two bonus chapters from Fourth Wing, we don't see Zayden use his second signet. She said that she picked those two scenes specifically because it means Zayden has his shields up, aka he's not using his intrinsic signet. Same Thing here. When he's thinking about Imogen wiping the memory of the healer, iconic, and how she's on a weapons drop off, quote, the thought makes me reinforce my shields just in case Dane acts on the threat in his eyes. Whenever he is especially in Dane's presence, Zayden firmly keeps his shields up, which is so smart of Rebecca to choose these for the bonus chapters. We don't get those clear spoilers and we get Zayden dunking on Dane. So this also means that he doesn't read Violet's thoughts in the scene or, of course, anyone else's for that matter, as we were saying. In Violet's POV, she is trying to speak back to him, but can't figure out how to do it. If he wanted to, he could easily use his intrinsic signet to glean her thoughts or intentions, whatever, but he doesn't because like he told her, once he fell in love with Violet, he doesn't read her mind. Well, at least not on purpose because there are a few moments after he falls in love with her where it's like an oopsie, I read her mind by accident. That is when they're having sex the multiple times. And of course, when she says the fucking traitor and at the very end of the book, he's like, I hear her call me a fucking traitor, which was what convinced me that he is an intrinsic. Side note, this is really making me want some bonus chapters from Iron Flame because then we would be able to get more insight into the oh, intrinsic yeah. segment. But I do wonder if she's waiting until Onyx Storm release as much like how she did with the bonus chapters yes. for Fourth Wing. So that's my prediction at least is me that too. we're going to get some Iron Flame bonus chapters, but only once we have Onyx Storm in our hands. All right, back to the confirmation that Emogen is on a secret mission. When we originally covered this chapter in our episode six, we wondered if the marked ones were delivering weapons to the very Griffin flyers who then attacked the outpost. We were very confused about why Emogen and Zayden would be okay with these same Griffin flyers turning around and attacking the outpost after they just handed them a bunch of weapons. And here we at least get clarity that it is not the same drift of Griffin flyers. Zayden is here to protect Violet and was initially horrified that it might be their doing with this oncoming attack. Quote, that approaching drift and whoever is responsible for compromising the power supply for the wards will kill her if given the chance. And that's not something I'll ever let happen. Which let's talk about the wards faltering. Let's have a little quick mini archive section here. We know that in order for the wards to stay intact this far from the Biscayath Wardstone, which is the source of the wards around the kingdom, they require the help of alloy. So every outpost has an armory with these alloy weapons, which stretch the wards to their limits and keep them working on the borders. When Griffin Flyers steal these alloy daggers, which is the only weapon to kill Venon, they are causing the wards to falter because not enough alloy at the outpost means no wards, which means here at Montserrat, the enemy is within the keep already, as Zayden points out. Sigale confirms that this wasn't Zayden's doing, aka it isn't the Griffin Flyers who Emogen met up with. Remember that Zayden brought alloy daggers with him from Besgaeth. He did not take them from here at Montserrat because as much as he's helping the Griffin
from flyers, he won't risk stealing enough alloy to make the wards falter. That is where he draws the line of helping them. Zadin and the Marked Ones get at least most of their alloy weapons from the Beskayath Forge. So we know that the enemy is or was already in the outpost taking the alloy. Sigale confirms that the incoming attack is close, but not there yet. Quote, wards will only fall this quickly if the power supply is compromised, dot, 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 or stolen. Which raises a question. Does the alloy have to be transported away from the outpost to make the wards falter? Because if they're on site and active, they're technically still supplying the wards power. This means the enemy was already within the wards and have stolen the alloy, taking it away from Montserrat and therefore making them falter. Or the enemy within the outpost currently is somehow deactivating the alloy to bring the wards down so then they can attack. And then they'd have to activate them again, I guess. I don't know. The nuances are a little confusing. I'm definitely leaning into they took them away, but I'm going to get into that in a second. Okay. So with all of this said, if this outpost attack is not the flyers our marked one's friends gave alloy weapons to... Who are the attackers? Like I said earlier, it might be the Signe's flyers who Zayden wanted Emogen to avoid because they would take the daggers and kill her to make a point. Or what if it's not a Griffin flyer at all? <sighs> we know from Jack fucking Barlow that there are already Venon working within the ranks of Navarre. So I've been waiting to talk about this. Here's my theory. Okay. <laughs> I believe that a Venon within Montserrat took down the wards by stealing the alloy and taking it away. But if that's the case, how did the flyers get here so fast? I.e. like 20 minutes after the wards fell. That seems a little on the nose. So what if the Signe's flyers are actually the poor meal equivalent of what Jack fucking Barlow is in Navarre? Jack fucking Barlow is a writer who wanted more power, so he became a Venon, but he is still bonded to a dragon. What if this riot of Signe's flyers are actually Venon, but they wanted more power, but they are still bonded to their griffins, and therefore they were able to know when the wards are taken down through some kind of Venon hive mind of the Venon, who I do believe is a writer, at Montserrat. If this is the case Zayden mentioning to Sigale of you know he's trying to get Violet to Taren and he's like if I get Violet to Taren I can go track down whoever like you know just took down the wards if that did happen he would have known months earlier that there are venom within the ranks of Navarre one thing I do also want to point out this is the second time in fourth wing alone that the wards have fallen within the Espen mountains if you remember in the first battle brief Professor Devera says that the wards fell and that allowed a drift to enter the Navarian territory and steal from the outpost but they came very quickly, meaning the Griffin Flyers, who already struggled with altitude, were already on their way. What if these Griffin Flyers who don't struggle with altitude, what if they're somehow Venon? And they knew the wards would fall then as well. So this is actually the second time this is happening. Fun fact about the Espen Mountains. This is also where the original orange dragon hatching grounds are. Not to mention, this is where multiple times in Battle Brief in both Fourth Wing and Iron Flame, the wards fall. And each time they fall, it is along the Signeson border. It is an attack on an outpost where either the wards have fallen or it is outside the wards. Now pause. Yes, flyers would probably want to zero in on these attacks because if the wards have fallen, they would be able to use their magic. Or what if they want to zero in on these attacks where the wards have fallen or there are no wards because they're outside of the wards because they're venom flyers and they want to make sure they can use their venom magic. This just feels way too coincidental. Like I am freaking out as I was doing my searches. I was like, no way, no way, no way. So I'm just, I'm taken away. I'm freaking out. <laughs> well, so, okay. So if you're, so you think that this wasn't Griffin flyers, this was Venon flyers on Griffins. So in that case, with the aftermath, why wouldn't they, ha like, I, I love this theory. Don't get me wrong. I love this theory. I'm just going to poke a few holes in it here now because everybody was okay after Montserrat. Like they, like Mira was not hurt or anybody was hurt. And so if it was Venon, nobody would make it out in the same way that they did. Okay. That is, that is a very fair point. I do want to point out that I don't believe that this is only Griffin Flyer Venon. I think that this is Griffin Flyer Venon and Ryder Navarian Venon. So the Ryder Navarian Venon is within the outpost making the wards fall. And then the Griffin Flyer Venon are the ones who are coming in and wreaking havoc. Now, to be fair, Jack fucking Barlow was all like, 
peace, you know, peace, love and whatever at Bez Gaia. So I do wonder if for whatever reason, the venom, I don't know. You, you make a really good point. Now I'm, all, <laughs> now I'm rethinking everything. Like, I, I love it. So so there also could be, I love the idea of it being someone within Navarre and it could be associated with the venom. Absolutely. But My they big- could also just be with the Signe Flyers. I, I don't know. Like that, that does feel a little bit more like a stretch with the Flyers being in league with the venom. Again, not all Flyers, just a certain group of Flyers. I do also want to point out a bit of related information that we can't forget. During a recent attack, if I remember correctly, we don't have a timestamp on it, but during a recent attack near the village of Cranston, Mira observed, quote, I could have sworn I saw a riot of dragons across the border during this attack. She shrugs, but questions about secret operations are above my pay grade. We speculated that this was actually a riot of wyverns that she saw. Unfortunately, we don't know where Cranston is because it's not on the map, but I don't think that it's connected to this attack or directly links the venom to it. It does, however, show more evidence that there are venom just on the other side of the border. Here's where I'm leaning into because this is the second time wards fall out of nowhere in the Espen Mountains and within 20 minutes, flyers are on their doorstep, which Devera notes and Violet notes in Battle Brief and their very first Battle Brief in Fourth Wing, that is really fast. So they already had to have been on their way, which makes me think that whatever caused the wards to fall and the flyers who are coming in have to be on the same side. But in order for wards to fall, I don't know. I feel like it's too easy for a flyer to sneak into these outposts and steal weapons. And that's what causes the wards to fall, especially with how it's worded in this bonus chapter where it's like, well, that means the enemy is already within. And if the enemy is already within, immediately my brain goes to Venon. So if there's a Venon within the keep saying, hey, like I'm going to take the wards down and then immediately flyers are on their doorstep, aka they already had to been on, on their way, there just feels like they need to be on the same side. Now, Signeeson is also quite close to the Barons. So it is possible that they're not Venon and they are just still working in leagues with the Venon because you know, they're... If you can't fight them, join them kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, exactly. So so that is also a possibility that I will totally submit to as well. But I don't know. I definitely think whoever took down the wards is a Navarian Venon spy. I agree with that. The very minimum some a, a mole in Navarre definitely yes. this is what I think bonus chapters should be like this is why bonus chapters I feel like need to have this like like if you just read this on the page you'd be like oh it was a griffin flyer who snuck into the keep and yada 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 but like we're able to go four or five layers deeper where we're suddenly looking up Bravik in both of the books <laughs> and then we'll get every single instance of when Bravik is mentioned now I will say too because this happens so often that would mean that there are venom or a Navarian mole who is working with the flyers all throughout the outposts, which exactly what does check out. Barlow, based, yes. Exactly. Exactly. Whew, I could talk about this forever, but let's move on to the Liam scene. I don't have a whole lot to say on this, even though it was my favorite scene in this bonus chapter. But the only thing I really do want to like hit on is Liam saying, was it us who took down the wards? The fact that he asks this not once, but twice, the first time more of like an accusation. And the second time he screams it at Zayden. Liam is not someone we associate that kind of emotional reaction to. And he is part, you know, team marked ones to help the Peromish. Like he is part of that team. But in true Liam fashion, he is so against the idea of risking others' lives in order to do so. And he's also one of the marked ones who has not done a weapons run yet. Or at least I'm assuming they don't let first years do it because A, danger, danger. And B, they're too busy learning how to ride their damn dragon in order to, you know, go off and do a weapons drop off. So it makes sense that he's the most, I'll call it spooked by this turn of events that could have easily been their own doing. And God, this scene just made me miss him so much. It was so hard to read. I I love Liam so much. And yeah, it was like, I love how it was an accusation at first because he has such strong morals that it's like, this is not our intention here. And yep. Last thing that we'll cover in depth before we move on to some foreshadowing slash quick favorite moments is the kiss scene. I loved getting to see this through Zayden's thought process because yes, Zayden did entirely kiss her to stall, you know, because he really just sees her wanting to like bolt to go help Mira. And is this the most noble thing, I'll say, deceiving her this way? No, of course not. But it's very Zayden. He is so morally gray. And for this section, I really looked at the two scenes side by side and like looked at it line by line. And what I loved seeing is how 
line by line, their thoughts were so aligned around this kiss. Mm -hmm. Both use language about the kiss being possibly the last one, about it being raw and wild. And I love how in Violet's POV, we get a quote, he lays claim to my mouth. And in Zayden's POV, he says, quote, I kiss her like she's mine. Like, I just love that. But (laughs) it's short-lived because he pulls away and the deception dawns on her. She says, quote, I will hate you for this. And he thinks, ouch, (laughs) which I just, you can, it's so small, but you can just feel the blow land on that one. Plus, after Violet gets scooped up by Taryn, Zayden thinks to Sigale how the only way Violet will forgive him, you know, for this kiss distraction is if Mira survives. Now, I do think a huge reason why he's in the hall outside of Markham's offense in the next scene in Violet's POV is because, you know, he loves her. He wants to support her, yada, yada, yada. But I also think if he's there because he thinks knowing Mira survived equals Violet forgiving him again. So I assume him sitting with her is also so that he gets that information ASAP. So if he knows if he has a shot of winning his girl back. I love that catch so much. Like that was fantastic there. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So while we've already shared some of the foreshadowing, let's pull out a few more moments of foreshadowing that we can tell or speculate here. Mira forces Zayden to help save Violet here and refuses to let him fight. She will make a similar call call next book when they're in a venom attack and after losing the writer Naira and three flyers from the footwing drift Zayden is almost killed by a venom draining the ground and it's only then that Mira tells a riot to fall back and retreat because of Violet and Zayden's connection. Zayden mentioning how he quote can't afford Atos senior making his life hell my guy might I introduce you to this little evil villain saying quote secrets die with the people who keep them and this one is more I'll never forget it. Okay, everybody. And what do we say? <laughs> Secrets Secret die with the, the people who keep, keep them. them. <laughs> Listen to our Iron Flame coverage for that to make sense. And the last one I have here is much more speculation. Zayden mentions how Violet will get over it if Mira dies, right? And it's said very offhanded and, you know, more as like a Zayden joke. But with as much possible sibling foreshadowing death there is, it did make me wonder. I was like, oh, shit. Is this foreshadowing that Mira is going to be the one who dies? Yeah. I don't like saying it because I love Mira, but storytelling wise, it would make a lot of sense. I don't think it's happening in Onyx Storm. (gasps) We're going to put a pin in that for the live show because I definitely do think that it's happening. I I, I say that, but like, I'm also so indecisive when it comes to these things. Like, I I just can't make a decision. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> It'll be fun to make bets live on stage with you. <laughs> Last but not least, let us do some fun highlights and favorite moments from this passage that we didn't mention above. This is such a small thing. I love how Zayden uses last names versus Violet always using first names. It just so sets the tone for Zayden, who is in a leadership role, rather than, you know, hanging out with his squad mode, which I do think the first time he uses a first name only when addressing someone directly, so like verbally addressing someone is not until part two of Iron Flame when he calls Rhiannon, Rhiannon, rather than Mateus. So I just thought that was interesting. Zayden scratching his relic as a fuck you to the other lieutenant. Plus, he holds their gazes the entire time. Like, Zayden wins every single stare competition that he has in this scene. And it's just so badass. I love it. And he knows it too. And he's just like, (laughs) oh man, it's exciting to see how Zayden's strategic mind works, to see him in his element and recognize how his smarts helped him become a wing leader. During Mira's battle brief like exercise with the group, he's silently coming up with four different battle strategies. Plus, only when Violet brings up using Mira in the battle plan, he acknowledges that he did not even think about using the other Soaring Gale. I just love seeing Violet's brilliant fucking womanness in his POV. Yep. Because, you know, we're in his head. He is a master strategist, and maybe not unlike Brennan, apparently, but he <laughs> is, at least in my mind. And seeing something that, oh, I didn't think about that. It's just like Zayden is such a wing leader, but it really shows how smart Violet is. And I just, I loved that little moment. I'm realizing if they do end up getting to their third year, Violet wouldn't even be eligible for being a wing leader because she's not a squad leader, huh? Correct. I don't think, and also I just don't think storytelling wise, it would make sense for her to be. No, And that's also Ree's role too, where she has, she has her own smarts and all that. Yeah. There, like I mentioned, so many of the little flirting moments are just so perfect, but there's one in particular, there's two in particular, right? There's three in particular I want to point out. (laughs) From 
putting his arm around Violet's chair and noting Dane's grinding teeth as a result. By the way, both Zayden and Violet's POV noticed Dane's grinding teeth when he put it around. <laughs> I love that. And there's also the, you know, shadow caressing her cheek, which I love this writing. This is, I think this is my favorite moment. It's not even flirting. It's just the writing around it. When the, you know, room goes totally dark and Violet gets like a little bit of that cheek caressing, one of the other writers in the room says, fuck me. <laughs> And I just think they took the words right out of Zayden's mouth. It's just perfect. <laughs> we can't forget the way that Zayden compliments Liam's wooden dragon figurines. Quote, yours are better. And Liam responds, grinning, I know. We don't see their friendship on the page a whole lot. And these tiny glimpses of their brotherhood just make me so happy and sad at the same time. Everything from how Liam gives Zayden a knowing look when Zayden sits next to Violet. He actually even moves Liam aside so that he can sit next to and Violet. And he's like, I'm he's here, like, buddy. I'm watching her now. Yeah. Like, you're taking the day off <laughs> or how when the older writers like do you boys just want to whip it out and measure Liam like stifles a laugh like Liam is just so overjoyed that Zayden is falling for someone and ditched cat like he's just <laughs> yes. so happy in the hallway with Mira and Violet Zayden lies that coming here wasn't his choice alluding to the mating bond between their dragons being the reason why he came to Montserrat and we get a line that could mean nothing or could be an easter egg to Violet's second signet quote lying is easy except when it comes to Violet. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. Now, we know her second signet, the one from Andarna, has not manifested by this point in our story. Rebecca has confirmed it manifests in Iron Flame. But with that said, is this Rebecca's way of dropping the hint that she is indeed going to be let's say, a truth sayer. That's not my first choice of what her second signet is going to be, but that is some evidence pointing to that. Of course, it is a very popular second signet theory, and this would be a wink, wink, nudge, nudge to what's to come. I will also just say one of the reasons that Zayden's intrinsic second signet manifested is because he is someone who needs to know if other people are lying or not. And he's not a true sayer. He's an intrinsic. So this also could be a hint, hint, wink, wink that uh, Violet's an intrinsic. But that's neither here nor there right now. Very true. Very true. <laughs> Again, not that her second signet has manifested yet. Just yes. a little Easter egg of what it could potentially be down the road. Exactly. Oh, much like how when in, in like chapter one, Violet mentions how like she's lightning fast, like stuff like that, yes. where it's like lightning hasn't manifested, but it's just those little writing hints. Last little favorite moment is from the hallway scene. Mira starts talking about, quote, do you even know why he hates our mother so much? To which Zayden cuts her off before she starts spilling the Lilith tea. And this does make me wonder, how much do you think Mira knows about the Lilith bargain? Or Lil I, I don't even think bargain. Like, I don't think she knows anything about the bargain, but Lilith's role with Zayden. That's where I was going to go with this. Okay. So I think that she knows about the scars on his back, but she does not know about their deal. Yeah. And Mira thinks, like others, that it was leadership, a.k.a. Lilith's idea to force the marked ones into the writer's quadrant. And she's like, and that's a, one more reason why he hates our mother and therefore us. When it was actually part of Lilith's deal with Zayden, they get to live and go to the writer's quadrant if she can call in a favor at any time time. Amazing. I could talk about this chapter forever and it's so good. <laughs> but that's it. That's all we got today, friends. Yeah, we, we got to get this episode out for you all. And we are just so excited to talk more Empyrean in the coming months here. Another reminder that on October 20th, we are going to be talking about our biggest questions leading up to Onyx Storm at our live show in Denver, Colorado. We are also going to be finishing the Akatar series deep dive in mid-December. And January is fully dedicated to the lead up to Onyx Storm. I'm sure we'll be getting some teasers. You know we'll be talking about all of that. Like, trust us, there is a lot more Empyrean coming for you, especially in the lead up to Onyx Storm here. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves because next Monday we are releasing the finale of our Akawar Deep Dive, Episode yes. 11, Chapters 75 through 82. Thank you, as always, to our executive producer, Hayden, a.k.a. our sanity manager. Thank you for the fast turnaround and editing for this episode. We love you. And like we mentioned at the top of the episode, if you are interested in more Fantasy Fangirls content and community and events, please do consider joining the Patreon party. It's so much fun, and we'd love to have you there. Also, in case you missed it on Instagram yesterday, we have collaborated with Sparrow and Wild for some Fantasy Fangirl temporary tattoos. We've got everything from Huzzah 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 to Spice Watch to GFDD, which Lexi and I are both, of course, repping today in honor of this bonus chapter. We also have a JFB with an egg. 
If you know, <laughs> you know, it's so much more. <laughs> so much more. You can find the link in the show notes to get your temporary tattoos just in time. Also for the live show. We cannot wait to see you all ripping them. And if you're like, wait, I need to see more fantasy fangirls news here because I'm apparently not following you on social media. Give us a follow at fantasy fangirls pod. We are very active on Instagram and TikTok. And last but not least, do not forget to share this with your fellow Empyrean friends. If you have been like, oh my God, I just need any morsel of scale and Zayden, then please send this episode to them and you can all celebrate the bonus chapter release together. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.